Let's take a short break now from the vocabulary for an excursion into the wonderful world of eponyms. Do you know what an eponym is? The word eponym, spelled E-P-O-N-Y-M, comes from Greek and means literally named after. An eponym is a word derived from a name or a name that becomes a word. The corresponding adjective is eponymous, spelled E-P-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S. So far in Level 8, you have learned four eponymous words, words derived from names. Bowdlerize, which comes from Thomas Bowdler, the prudish expurgator of Shakespeare and the Bible. Quixotic, which comes from Don Quixote, the romantic dreamer. Martinet, which comes from General Jean Martinet, the rigid disciplinarian. And Mercurial, which comes from the fleet-footed, unpredictable Roman god Mercury. You may recall that in the discussion of prodigious, keyword 48 of level 5, we covered four more eponymous words. Gargantuan, from Rabelais' character Gargantua, the gluttonous giant. Herculean, from the mighty hero Hercules. And two eponyms that come to us from Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Lilliputian, which means like the tiny inhabitants of the mythical land of Lilliput, and Brobdingnagian, which means like the gigantic inhabitants of the mythical land of Brobdingnag. Finally, in Level 6, you also learn several eponyms from ancient Greece, including Procrustean, which comes from Procrustes, the brutal robber who stretched people's bodies or cut off their limbs to make them conform to the size of his bed, Draconian, which comes from Draco, the authoritarian statesman whose code of laws was so severe that it imposed the death penalty for nearly all crimes, great or small, Epicurean, which comes from the philosopher Epicurus, who advocated the pursuit of pleasure through the practice of virtue, Pyrrhonism, which comes from Pyrrho, the exponent of absolute skepticism, and Solacism, which comes from the rude and foul-mouthed inhabitants of Soloi. In modern usage, a Solacism is a gross grammatical error or social indiscretion. As the words Lilliputian, Brobdingnagian, and Solacism illustrate, eponyms can be formed from the names of places or whole populations, as well as from the names of individuals. Among the thousands of eponyms in the English language, two of the most familiar are sandwich and silhouette. It is said that the word sandwich was born when John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, grew hungry after a long night at the gaming table and instructed his servant to fetch him a snack consisting of slices of roast beef placed between two pieces of toasted bread. The word silhouette comes from Etienne de Silhouette, a French minister of finance in the 18th century who imposed severe luxury taxes and stringent austerity measures in an attempt to revive the French economy after the Seven Years' War. According to Robert Hendrickson, in his Dictionary of Eponyms, Names That Became Words, because silhouette cut expenses to the bone until they became mere shadows of their original selves, his name inspired the phrase a la silhouette, meaning on the cheap, and the phrase was applied to pants made without pockets, to coats made without folds, and to the inexpensive shadow portraits that happened to be in vogue in Paris at the time. Would you like an all-American eponym? The useful word maverick, spelled M-A-V-E-R-I-C-K, comes from the surname of Samuel Augustus Maverick, a gentleman rancher in 19th century Texas who neglected to brand his cattle. The unbranded cows came to be called mavericks, and later the word was applied to any person who stands apart from the herd, a nonconformist. The moral censorship exercised by the editor Thomas Bowdler 
was nothing compared with the campaign against vice waged by the man who gave his name to the word Comstockery, spelled capital C-O-M-S-T-O-C-K-E-R-Y. In his Dictionary of Eponyms, Robert Hendrickson explains that Anthony Comstock, who lived from 1844 to 1915, was the founder of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice and a self-appointed crusader against immorality in literature. After helping to secure passage of the so-called Comstock Laws, which outlawed objectionable matter from the mails, Comstock became a special agent of the post office, a position in which he had the power of an inquisitor. According to Hendrickson, Comstock is said to have arrested 3,000 persons over a 40-odd year career and destroyed about 160 tons of books, stereotyped plates, magazines, and pictures that he deemed obscene. The crusader particularly objected to George Bernard Shaw's play Mrs. Warren's Profession, and in 1905, Shaw coined the word making good clean fun of his name. Today, the word Comstockery means narrow-minded, bigoted, and self-righteous moral censorship. I'd like to conclude this excursion into the world of eponyms by telling you the story of the word chauvinism, which is spelled C-H-A-U-V-I-N-I-S-M. Nicolas Chauvin was a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars and a fervent follower of the emperor. After the defeat and exile of Napoleon, Chauvin became so zealous in his demonstrations of patriotism and allegiance to the fallen emperor that people began to ridicule him. Robert Hendrickson notes that Chauvin would have escaped national attention if several dramatists hadn't decided to mock him in their plays, and eventually Chauvin became the laughingstock of all of France. The French coined a word for his blind love of country, which soon made its way into English. Today, the word chauvinism means overzealous patriotism, and a chauvinist is a super-patriot, a person unreasonably and militantly devoted to his country. Those are still the meanings of these words today. In the last 30 years, however, the phrase male chauvinism has been used to mean a zealous and obnoxious belief in the alleged superiority of men over women. In recent years, people have begun to drop the word male and use chauvinism to denote a supercilious attitude of men toward women, and chauvinist to mean a man who treats women as inferior. That usage is unfortunate, for today many people think chauvinism means only male chauvinism, and the original meaning of the word is now in jeopardy. There is nothing wrong with adding a new sense to a word when there is a clear need for it, but the addition ought not to be at the expense of an older meaning that still has a useful and precise function in the language. Now that you know the story of Nicolas Chauvin, I hope you will take care to specify male chauvinism when that is meant, and reserve the word chauvinism to mean super-patriotism, overzealous devotion to one's country. And now it is time to leave the land of eponyms and return to the verbal advantage vocabulary. Here are the next 10 keywords in level 8.